And we're back with some more oxygen not included. And today we're going to be going over a few of the bases I was sent in. This one is a beauty. This one here supports eight duplicates with no inputs and no outputs forever. Inside a rocket. This is uh, this is little leftovers of the rocket capsule as you can see right here. There's the diamond window tiles on each side. There's the door for going in and out. And this is the rocket that results in it. Now before we go any further, I'm just gonna do something a little freaky here. I'm gonna hit Control F on the keyboard. We've got debug enabled, so boom, we can now see everything. Let's just bring up debug mode. This is what you're actually inside of when you're using a rocket. You're, you're just encased in some neutronium. You just can't see it around the edges because it's sort of blacked out. The game blacks out so you can't see the neutronium. I understand why that happens. Anyway, let's get started into this little gem of a build. This save was sent in by Gekbru... Gekbru... Ge they, it was sent in a while back, about a month ago. Uh, I only got around to it now, but... Ooh. Okay, first up, oxygen. How do you get it? Well, oxygen comes from polluted dirt. Where does the polluted dirt come from? Polluted dirt comes from the ethanol distilleries. Where do the ethanol distilleries get their wood from that allows them to produce the polluted dirt? Well, we have six wild-grown trees up here. So six wild arbor trees and six tame arbor trees. Where do we get the polluted dirt and water to actually run these? Well, that's kind of a circular thing. You see, all of that uh, wood goes down here all the way around and back over to this section where it is picked up by these auto sweepers and dumped into the ethanol distilleries. Ethanol distilleries spit out ethanol polluted dirt, carbon dioxide, a little bit of heat. So ethanol goes over here, powers this petroleum generator, keeps it 100% uptime. It just stays up constantly. Perfection. That's two gigawatts of sil solid power. At the same time, you're getting 3.333 grams of polluted dirt. So about a kilo and a third of polluted dirt a second. Oh. Carbon dioxide, door crusher. It's just a very simple door crusher here. It opens, it closes, and all the carbon dioxide trapped in that corner gets destroyed. The carbon dioxide here gets forced out. But it just means that this never overpressurizes or gets too high in pressure. Very simple way of taking care of the problem. Anyway, the uh, polluted dirt down here, that goes on to a conveyor system as well. Goes up here past this section, fills this conveyor receptacle. We'll, we'll come back to that one. Keeps going on, and then that polluted dirt goes all the way over here and gets dumped into these sublimation stations, which then turn it into polluted oxygen. Then that polluted oxygen floats all the way down the right-hand side of the rocket, all the way down to here, where it gets frozen. There's a, a thermal regulator over here. It's pumping around hydrogen. It's cooling down this section. The gas cools down, and then it gets pumped up via a little mini pump and some radiant pipes made of al aluminium. And then what happens is it counter flows up. So as the oxygen, as the polluted oxygen comes down, it gets pre-chilled, so it takes less energy to cool it down, which is why you're able to get away with one thermal regulator. And on the way back up, it heats back up the oxygen coming down, or the polluted oxygen coming down. This is basically cleaning the polluted oxygen. By liquefying it and turning it back into oxygen, you, you've got rid of the dirt magically. And then that gets dumped over here and turned back into oxygen, which is now overpressurized this area to 200 kgs. That gives you your oxygen. Oxygen flows out here and gets pumped around the, the base. There's only two outputs. One here is just a regular one, and then there's a high-pressure vent here hooked up to an atmos sensor to keep it below three and a half kilos. Done. That's your oxygen supply. Now, there is a... Uh, well, there's a lot more balancing going on than that. Oh my god, so much balancing. Right. These things require... The unwild ones of these, or the non-wilded ones, they require polluted... They require dirt, and they also require polluted water to grow. So, where do we get that? First up though, the polluted water. I'm not going to go too detailed into the numbers here, but basically this petroleum generator, which is constantly up, is spitting out 750 grams of polluted water all the time. This is enough to support about 6.4 of these arbor trees, which is right there. Perfect. Done. That leaves you with about 0.4 of whatever it is to do a few other things, but we'll get back to that. And then when it comes to the actual dirt itself, well, that's not too hard. It just takes 10 kilos of dirt a cycle. And here you go. You got a compost. Remember earlier when we were getting that polluted dirt up to go make oxygen? Well, it get, drops off in here in this conveyor receptacle. And then that gets auto-swept from this auto-sweeper up here into this compost. And this produces about 100 grams of dirt per second. And then that gets fed to the trees. So, balanced. Nice and balanced. So this sort of self-supports itself for power, water, oxygen, and just those few extra arbor trees help make the whole thing self-sustained and just perfect, beautiful. 
However, there's like all sorts of problems. Like this is generating heat. Where where is that going? Uh, also, how do you regulate the temperature of the base? Uh, how do you do food? There's all sorts of other things, and they all kind of feed in slightly off this whole system. It's a bit of a brain melter. First, let's try water supply. You need water to go into the carbon sink, and you need water to go into your toilets. So where does that come from? Well, no filtration medium, because that would be, you know, something that would require consumption. So, down here, this polluted water that gets sent up to the trees. There is a little side branch off here that goes into the steam room. And then, due to a bunch of automation, yeah, yeah, I know. That took a while to work my way through. Uh, long story short, if water is required, polluted water goes in here, it gets boiled, that water gets boiled and gets sent across this direction. So this is 95C water, gets sent into the toilets and gets sent down to the carbon sink, skimmer. And John, Now, this only requires a tiny amount of water and there's actually a small problem according to his email. It actually is heat negative. So you end up not having enough heat in the system because, well, this, to generate the heat, you have to run water through the aqua tuner. And, well, run something through it. And what's running through it right now is polluted water. The polluted water is actually a big cooling loop that goes the whole way around the base. Typically, it's more of a temperature regulation loop than a cooling loop. But if it gets too hot, this thing will activate and cool down the water going through the cooling loop. Thing is, it doesn't really happen very often. Right now, it's at 28.9 degrees. So what happens is there's a little extra loop that goes down here past thermal regulator. So if things get too cold on the loop, some of the water gets circulated past here to draw up some heat, because down here it's like 47 degrees or so. That that dumps heat into the polluted water going by, which warms up the loop to make sure that nothing stifles, because you got to keep the trees at a certain temperature, you got to keep the reed fiber at a certain temperature. And there, that's how the water is provided for the toilets and for the carbon skimmer. And it's all... Oh, like the, there's systems feeding off other systems and balancing each other out and it's just that that fries my brain I prefer closed loop systems where like one thing does one job or two tops and that's it You don't have to worry about it If any problems happen over here, this will cause problems that will cascade through it and cause so many other problems Th This is the kind of design I just I would never do I just couldn't do it I would be too terrified of things breaking down then comes food Shovels used to just be able to wild ranch them and, well, wild ranch them. You could tame them and then just keep grooming them and they drop an egg before they died and you could just, you know, keep doing that again and again. However, the new uh, delectable mechanic means you've always got a 2% chance you're going to end up with a delectable, which, you know, problem. In fact, you're probably going to end up with a few more because the temperatures in here are below 30 degrees. Your chances go up if their temperature are between 60 and 100. Actually, no, they're outside of that range. Eh, whatever. Yeah, but 2% chance. So what happens is there's three breeder shovels over here. The thing is, they'll only drop one egg and then they'll starve. So what you have to do is keep them alive. And this is, um, actually this is pretty good. Pretty dark in many ways. So what happens here is there is this timer sensor and every eight cycles, it's right here. Every eight cycles, this counts down, unleashes this thing, which opens up these little things up here and they drop two, four, six, about six kilos of dirt on the, well, six kilos of dirt, two out of each one. There may be a little bit of wonkiness here and there because it's hard to get these things to do precisely what you want. But let's see here, we're almost there. All right, let's slow this down. So this will activate this. It's the eighth cycling of it, so it turns green. That activates this, which is a buffer gate. Continue sending green signal for an amount of time after the input receives a red signal. And so this sends it up there. And if we watch, boom. So we've got ourselves two kilos, two kilos, two kilos. This one seems to send out an extra two kilos every time. But because it falls into three separate piles, and all of them are very hungry, all three of them go around and start eating. So you'll notice this shovel is about to die. It's, well, it's two cycles away from death. Now it's about to grab a snack. And now it's ten cycles away from death. It's just, if you feed anything that's starving to death, a tiny piece of food even, it will reset its counter. So even if it's seconds away from death, a gram of a gram of a gram of food will suddenly cause it to reset its uh, death cycle counter, it'll go back to 10. This means they won't die. Well, it doesn't improve the reproduction rate, but it does mean that they live long enough to drop two eggs in their life cycle. And this ability to generate just one extra egg for their life cycle, meaning a two out of each one, keeps this whole thing self-sustaining so you don't have to worry about running out of shovels. Ah, genius little idea that. It's like lots of nice little things working together here. However, that little tiny drain of dirt is, uh, well, not a huge problem, but a minor problem. It means there's not going to be enough dirt for all the arbor trees, which is why there's some pips up here. The pips will eat some tree branches. Uh, the pips will pop out some dirt every time they eat tree branches, so you get a little bit of dirt out of them. 
and the sort of evens out the whole system. I kind of liked that the end of it was like, well, we're a tiny bit short on dirt. Let's just chuck in some pips in there. It'll work out. It'll be fine. Oh, one last thing. Just to balance out the power output, there is a solar panel in the top right corner. And normally, well, the thing about solar panels is they don't block any radiation. They're one of the few tiles you can use to let all the radiation through an area. Very nice that way, though probably not good for your duplicates, especially considering they'll be wandering around up here maybe a little bit too much. I think the reason for the uh, the water here, just my theory, there's nothing said about it, it's to discourage duplicates from standing around in there. Duplicates are more than happy to stand around it here, it seems, but they don't seem to want to step forward that just that little bit more. It seems getting their toesies wet is uh, this, that acts of discouragement. Never would have thought it. I assume that's what's going on there, but if that's the case, that's a genius little workaround. Look at it, look. Just stops dead right before it, avoiding all of that high radiation level. Huh. Now, there's a few other safety features lurking around here, like an Atmos sensor down here with a door to maybe stop this if it overpressurizes. It just seems that there's uh, these things won't sort of shut off, as in they're, they're over, they've got a layer of petroleum beneath them so that they could just keep operating forever. Uh, you can see here that the gas pressure's gone up to 23, 24 kilos. But... It seems rather stable. I would love to run this for just a few thousand cycles to make sure that it works fine. I was checking the edges of the duplicates. Some of them are uh, 100 or a couple hundred cycles old, but some of them are only 25 or so. But I think this looks really good. Oh, in the center here, there is a vacuum area for the exosuit forge, storage of stuff, and you can go in here and access the steam turbine area. I think this was more of a, an afterthought. There's definitely a little bit more space there if you want to squeeze some stuff in, but who cares? It's eight duplicates forever and ever in space. Though I don't think they can get out. Oh, and one last thing, for those of you who are unfamiliar, this is what an oxygen unincluded map actually looks like. So this is all the maps, like every world is just a different map squeezed in somewhere. Pretty sure that's a, oh, that looks like the aquatic planet, though you can't see any of the water there. This is uh, the ice planet, and all of the rockets usually spawn down here somewhere, and I'm guessing that these rooms here are either former rockets that got deconstructed or something along those lines. You can, this is why you might be playing the game, and, oh, there's a capsule over here. And you might see a big sparkle streak come from all the way over here towards your capsule, just flying across the screen. That's because what's happened is your duplicate is teleporting from all the way over here to all the way up there. And it doesn't matter where your base is, like even if it's just here, you're always going to see it coming from the bottom right. All the capsules seem to end up down here. Anyway, big thanks to G GHK Brew, Gek, Gek, Brew. Oh, yeah, I, I, I'm like 20% convinced that you picked that name just to mess with me. But anyway. Beautiful, beautiful idea, incredibly well balanced. It's uh, a 2000 all, you, 2000 cycled all map. I'm guessing that took a while. Very, very nicely done. Next up, we have a quick sidestep from Doug here. This is a fish farm. Now, when I was doing up the little tree thing and doing a, a fish design and all that, this, this was a very, very popular recommendation and it's the, the variable door approach. This got mentioned a lot, like an awful lot. This one's very simple. Basically, all the eggs from here get shunted into there. This is where you keep your wild pack, or not your wild pack, you're basically where you dump all your eggs. This is your breeding pool. So you breed in here, and you dump all the rest of the eggs in here to just sit around and eventually turn into more fish food for you, or more food. More food. So how do you keep this breeding pool topped up? Well, doors. That's it. There's simply a door sensor. So let's just grab you and put you over there. Now there's not enough fish, it opens the doors. So now when the next fish egg hatches, it'll flop across here and land on this pool. And then when a fish flops in there, the door locks and the rest of the fish have to go into this side. Just allows you to variably bounce them back and forth. I'm not sure how good that would do once it gets up to about 600 fish though. You gotta worry that there'd be multiple fish that'd pop at the same time and start gumming up the works. But I think for anything sub a few hundred, you're probably good with this. Doug has also provided with this, the American way, oh sorry, the American way. Uh, over here we have a, well, compressed petroleum, just so that you could, well, you can cram in so much petroleum into one of these. And it's an on-demand power setup, so it's not an always-on type system. But this here is your forge petroleum generators, then you've got your power control station here to crank them up even higher if you want. And all of the polluted water that comes out of them comes down here, gets dumped into that section, it gets pumped across over here and then steamed. Any excess steam gets dumped down here and into the infinite liquid storage. This gets dumped in here. Well, the water is pumped in here to make oxygen. The oxygen is then pumped around the base. So infinite liquid storage for oxygen, infinite petroleum storage for power, food, berry sludge. Several hundred kilos of berry sludge. Stuff never goes off. It's, it really is the best space food. 
The toilets are just running on a water sieve system, so this is going to require sand, but infinite storage right here to store all your stuff, so you don't really have to worry about it. I would probably put that on an insulated tile, though. You never know when you're going to accidentally dump a f stuff that is a few hundred or even a thousand degrees in there. Uh, there is two cooling loops going on here. You got one cooling loop going on that cools the rest of the or the entire base, and then another cooling loop up here that cools down all the petroleum generators and the steam turbines on top. Oh, and an entire line of solar at the top, just because. Though, uh, it's got plastic below it to stop it the whole place from ending up fried. Finally, over on the far right, we've got ourselves a nature reserve. I forgot to do the room bonuses in the, the last video as well. But, very standard issue. Not nuclear reactors style, but I do like that it went with just pure petroleum. Suppose... If you had enough petroleum, you could definitely make a rocket that would last for it for the what was it we're going for a thousand cycles. Now, have to give an A plus for the coloring in here. What is that? The grape escape. Yeah, I'm gonna have to use that one. That looks amazing. Oh wow! They actually have a, a literal Delu X background tiles. Okay. Uh, a plus for the decoration. A plus for the decoration. Thanks for that one, Doug. Next up, we have Southern Skies with an actual 15 duplicate rocket. Not only that, they've managed to squeeze in 15 Atmosuit docks. Right. All right, okay. Okay, first things first. They squished up the reactor two tiles. They moved it up two tiles. That has meant that the radiation shielding shields the rockets an awful lot better. So now that the radiation is coming across here, instead of going up and radiating people who are going for their Atmos suits, just a couple of tiles, sacrifice for it, but it works. And refined carbon shield on the inside instead of the outside. That was, yeah, that was one of the retrofits I really should have done. This just makes such a difference. That way you can insulate around the top and you don't have to care. Though using ISO resin is a bold choice, considering it relates at 200 degrees. But uh, yeah, I, I suppose it's insulated tiles. Chance of that happening, super slim. Just don't ever put like a pipe bridge in there. If you put in like a plumbing bridge, uh, like I accidentally did, like something like that, uh, the heat will probably melt one of those tiles. Would be hilarious, but uh, maybe for only a few minutes. Anyway, actual uses for ladder beds. I, I, I never thought I'd see the day. These ladder beds actually fit in here perfectly. That's a genius use for them. Normally I just, it, it just seems that normal beds work out almost better because you don't need the walls. Oh, never mind. I'll, I'll explain that badly no matter what way I do it, but I've never really been able to find a situation where ladder beds are actually superior to just regular old beds. Alright, uh, bathrooms, three bath, three lavatories? You are spoiling the duplicates. Three of them? You just need 15 in there, just a really tight bathroom schedule, and you can have, like, one toilet and one hand sanitizer, and they're good. Okay, but, uh, yes, yeah, so we can definitely squish things down if needs be, but that's amazing how much you're able to fit in here. There's, like, a, there is an entire jukebox and a sauna. Respect. Okay, so, uh, three gas pumps here, which just gives you enough oxygen to support 15 duplicates precisely. I do like the way, oh, too many gas pumps just for a little bit of overkill. I like that. I think there was some problems with forgetting the rocket control station, so there was some shunting done here, but, uh, this works out perfectly. That just gives you that little bit of extra oomph so you never have to worry, like, uh, if you have 15 duplicates and only enough for 1.5 kilos of oxygen, you kind of get nervous, you know? Maybe things go a little bit off someday, but this means you have that little bit extra to depend upon. Now that's... Ooh, and the piping here is kind of hilarious. Uh, I'm not sure what would happen if uh, these got cut off or... You know what? You'd have to do some fiddling around with that, but I'm sure it'll work fine. Uh, Exosuit Forge, absolutely essential. Only one thimble... Actually, three thimble reed? Yeah, that should be sufficient, but you know, this isn't meant as a long-term survival thing. This is meant to be just getting us to the other side and surviving for about a thousand cycles. And this would more than cover it. Plus, it's got the whole shovel farm going on, combined with cooking it up and dumping it down there. I don't think we've got enough shovels, though, for another rocket. Hmm. We'll have to do something different with the food, but I'm liking the baseline design for this. This is rock so Ooh. Let's see. Ah, yeah, this is, goes with one of the older designs. This is uh, an older email as well. And this one here, it's not rotating like we... In the end, what we ended up doing was taking this and rotating it again through the steam room to reheat it back up and then rotating it around. That way you only have to sort of fill it once and then it just keeps rotating. So it cuts down on power savings and just make sure it's nice and stable. We had problems with turning off the reactor with this sort of setup. But no, ooh. And plastium ladder segments down here. That means this area down here could technically be serviceable if you wanted it to. I like having the option to service this because you never know when things are going to break. You just never know. Water sieve, not a fan of. I think we can get rid of the water sieve and replace that with boiling water, but this one is just your 
Like, you have so much extra room here, it's kind of crazy. You've managed to fit, you managed to hit all the design requirements, and still it's like, oh, I'll just chuck down a water sieve, who cares if you had, you could have boiled it, but you're like, no, 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 we're good. I do think, let me check this down here. This we'd want to be a little bit careful with, that's almost stifling some of those plants. Gotta be super careful about that. I think what I'd do is probably use this as a temperature moderator. So I'd have the, the water circulate through here so that it stabilizes with whatever the temperature in the liquid in there is. That would give you a perfectly even keel, but I like this one. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be stealing a few bits and bobs of this, I think, in the final design. Very nice. Thanks again for that one, Southern Skies. Next up, we have Safi from Germany, who's went with a few different options here. The first one that really sticks out, they strapped a steam turbine on top of the reactor. Instead of, like, leaving it out here on the side, they just stuck it on top. Oh, I like that. That opens up options. Like, just knowing you can do that frees you up on a bunch of other stuff. Now, they did have to get a little bit creative with the uh, the refined carbon here, just to make sure that they didn't radiate the bejesus out of certain parts of the base. But that opens up options, for example, for them to make a nature reserve down here using sporkins. What the hell? Okay, okay. This is almost not as bad as it looks. So the sporkins are down here in the bottom part of the base, which is full of carbon dioxide. So the zombie spore germs are only in the carbon dioxide. They can't get past this year. It's like a little piece of uh, napta. So all the spore kid germs are down here in the carbon dioxide and dupes don't breathe carbon dioxide. So they shouldn't get infected with the spore kids. Shouldn't. So they shouldn't get zombified. In theory. But you know, live dangerously I suppose is, is the theory here. Just don't let any oxalite get in here or you'll have problems because the dupes will come down here sometimes and try and breathe it in and... Yeah, there's a lot of germs. Oh my god. Okay, anyway. Madness aside, you'll notice this is a nature reserve on the way out. Great hall, barracks, 15 bunks, and a washroom with four full-on sinks and four toilets. How much space did you have? Oh, enough to put in three showers. There's freaking showers in here. Who does that? Not one shower, but three. Oh my god. Oh yeah, and this. This looks super cool. Uh, you got two submerged electrolyzers, and yeah, they're just compressing the hydrogen into the corner. They're like, yeah, whatever, who cares? Let it just stay there. That's it. Just the hydrogen ends up over there. Uh, these things pull out the oxygen that's in the middle. Oxygen gets circulated around the base. Done. Uh, so the oxygen comes down here, across, and into the atmosphere ducts, and we've got another set coming over here somehow. Yeah, whatever. I don't think you're going to be able to fill that many suits with just one line, though. That could be tweaked. But still, look at that. That's a 15 duplicate base with four toilets, four sinks, three showers, all crammed into a rocket. Oh, water goes through a water sieve. Ah, okay, polluted water comes across here, gets dumped into the water sieve, water sieve cleans it, fills back up toilets and sinks. And, oh, and showers. And then the excess polluted water comes down here, feeds into a reed fiber, and the excess, excess polluted water comes down here and gets dumped into the nuclear reactor to be, well, turned into steam. Steam stuff should be bled off. How? Where is the steam bleed? I can't see a steam bleed there, so in theory, if polluted water was slowly been out here, it would eventually overpressurize the reactor, but it's okay, we know how to bleed steam off. Ooh, yeah, that's a lot of pixel packs for when you just want that extra, extra decor glow. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Delicious. Ho, 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 ho. Water storage right in the middle of the rocket, like right next door to here, they have super overpressure. I can just, I can hear the creaking of that door as it contains hundreds of tons, not thousands of tons of water. And above here, you've got like the visco gel or like your other liquid that prevents the vent from overpressurizing. And it's just surrounded by some glass. One kilo of glass is all that stands between them and an ocean crushing the inside of the rocket and killing all. But hey, you know. They live with spore kids down here. These duplicates are pretty, um... Yeah, they're immune to danger. Danger's their middle name. For cooling, they did not go with an aqua tuner. I think this is... a first? The cooling of the entire base comes from two thermal regulators running on hydrogen. I mean, power efficiency, who cares? You've got a nuclear reactor in here. It's not like it's a big deal. And yet, it doesn't... Huh. Interesting, I suppose you don't have to worry about overlapping pipes with all of the other liquids you've got running around the place, so it simplifies everything. Okay, you still gotta worry about oxygen, but that's not nearly as bad as all the piping going around the place. Huh. Okay, options. I like it. This steam turbine? Amazing. That one, I may end up stealing. This? No! 
Just no. Who put sporkins in here? You're a lunatic. I mean, don't get me wrong, Saf Safi, Safti, Saf. I love, I love the, the moxie of putting spore kids just in your rocket. That is, uh, that is up there with, with throwing in like a, an Aku statue. But no, I am not that suicidal. Plus, I'm not sure if I got spore kids now. I probably do. I will say though, getting these pedestals with all of these uh, self-contained systems on it, no way. You, you can't get that many self-contained systems on a playthrough. Though I, I do appreciate, I do appreciate the trying. And uh, what's this down here? Vacuum storage. Ah, okay, so it must get pre-chilled. Oh, actually, no, never mind. So the cooling for the steam turbines is also cooling down the metal tile, which is keeping the frost burgers chill. So you're telling me dupes have to wade through a whole bunch of sporkid germs to get to their dinner before going back up to eat it. How have none of them gotten, like, ah, uh, zombie spores, contraction rates, 73% will result in zombie spores. Hmm. I suppose they are being radiated gently from space at all times. Oh, actually, no. Blocked it off. Refined carbon, 1,500 kilos. Pretty much reduced that to oh, 10 to 71 rads. Quite low. Anyway, thanks for that one, Safi. I am definitely stealing that steam turbine idea. I don't know if I can figure this out enough to replicate this design quite so well, but that is beautiful. Oh, and there is gas coming in the bottom there. Or there was, seemed to be a gas, but I presume that was for prep, but uh, I have no way of knowing. Also, there uh, appears to be this pipe over here. This appears to be what pumps out the carbon dioxide that accumulates in the corner. But it looks to be set up by a manual switch, and the gas is just entirely vented into space. Pretty sure we could do some modifications to make that slight... Well, actually, no. You went with gas cooling, so you've actually run out of space for piping almost. Hmm. Swings and roundabouts. Swings and roundabouts. Thanks again for this one. Interesting choices. Well, I have far too many mails to go through to finish this all in one video. I think I'm going to have to try and squeeze in an extra video before next Monday just to try and get all of the submissions out of the way. Thanks for everyone who submitted the ones. These are just... There are so many ideas in here I want to steal. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed them as much as I did, and uh, good luck.